Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Well, I, I've been tracking the work of the tremulous hand of Worcester for a good while now, watching him uh, read old English manuscripts that are remove of almost 700 years. Uh, most of you will be familiar with him. He's that 13th century scribe with a characteristically shaky scrawl. And this picture actually comes from an article that just appeared. Uh, it's a pre-publication thing that I uh, pulled off of uh, Facebook. Uh, his, his tremor has been diagnosed. Um, so if you, if you want that reference, well, there it is. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating read, and, and I grabbed this picture uh, to give you an example of, of his, of his uh, tremor. Anyway, so he's, uh, the tremulous hand is in the news. Um, anyway, he marked up some 20 manuscripts, glossing, annotating, and leaving other kinds of traces in his mission to learn Old English and call from these sources materials he would put to some other purpose, be it teaching or preaching. Among the many different kinds of interventions he applied to these manuscripts were thousands of linguistic glosses in Latin, word uh, division indicators, lists of word pairs in Latin and Old English, superscript letters indicating phonological difference, differences between his form of English and the original Old English, to name just the most prominent ones. I've got examples of all of these, which I'll gladly show you later, but in the interest of time, I want to focus on two kinds of interventions that are of greatest imp importance for our understanding of why Tremulus was reading and repurposing uh, the contents of these manuscripts. The first consists of his so-called many varied annotations. These take the form uh, of marginal flags, words, or symbols, and the margins that indicate his interest in the passages they draw attention to. Uh, these nota signs have several forms as well. As you can see here, tremulous employed abbreviations, keywords like exemplum and narratio, phrases beginning with de or quote, and names occurring in the text which run the gamut from biblical figures to classical and Germanic gods to saints and other historical figures. Likewise, the names of the church fathers uh, flag passages from their works, especially Augustine and Gregory. And Bible passages are marked as well, usually with the name of the book or author. A Latin translation is then sometimes added in the margin. Now, all of this glossing, marking, and annotation of Old English manuscripts had to serve a purpose. The early 13th century was not an age of antiquarian hobbyism. And the work clearly took its toll on Tremulus, as witnessed by his flagging of two remedies for sore eyes in the herbal in Part B of Hatton 76. Of the many possibilities suggested by critics, the purpose of all this that seems most likely is that Tremulus was collecting and compiling materials for the creation of a vernacular handbook for preaching. But there's one type of intervention applied pretty consistently to all the manuscripts Tremulus marked up that's only been mentioned in passing by others, his selective repunctuation of the text he encountered in these manuscripts. In brief, Tremulus added or altered the punctuation of the original Old English scribes using a system of posituri, inserting the simple punctus, the punctus versus, and the punctus elevatus, where they do not appear in the original. And moreover, he frequently converts existing punctuation in most cases, transforming the simple point to a punctus elevatus. I'll give you a few examples of what I'm describing here very, very quickly, and I can come back to these later in the, uh, the Q&A. Here's two examples of, of an inserted uh, punctus elevatus and, and, and punctus added to the text. Here, a punctus elevatus, once again, and this is an instance of, um, of, a, of a point being converted to the punctus elevatus. Now, this system of, of punctuation was originally developed for indicating appropriate pauses in liturgical texts, but later came to be used on non-liturgical ones as well. The most common and widely employed of these posituri is the simple punctus, used to mark boundaries between coordinate clauses, while the punctus elevatus marks a heavier pause um, uh, than the punctus, but lighter than the punctus versus, which might be used in the same way as our semicolon. That is, to mark the end of, a, of two related clauses or sentences, but not the end of the sentence as a whole. In many of the manuscripts Tremulus consulted, the original Anglo-Saxon scribes who wrote them employed a much sparser system of punctuation, sometimes limited to the simple punctus alone, which in fact resembles the earlier system of distinctiones developed by Donatus, whereby the position of the point relative to the base of the line indicated how heavy or light the pause was to be. Be that as it may, elsewhere I have suggested that such repunctuation on the part of the tremulous hand indicates a high level engagement with the Old English, as opposed to the semantic tagging of his glossing activities. It's possible, I argue, to virtually look over his shoulder as he works through these texts, reading with his pen, as it were, adding and changing posituri to work out the precise meaning of his chosen passages. 
This is elocutionary pointing, applied to texts to aid in reading them out loud. And in this instance, I would argue that Tremulus is doing just that as he strives to understand the Old English. Now, the main point to be made here, no pun intended, is that these punctuation interventions provide us with another important clue as to the kinds of things that Tremulus was interested in and searching for in these manuscripts. Sometimes the repunctuated passages corroborate indications of other clues, such as note to signs in the margins next to passages of interest. But in other cases, such in indications are absent. And if it weren't for the presence of these interventions, I argue, we wouldn't know that Tremulus was interested in them at all. Now, there are several ways to demonstrate that the Tremulus hand was indeed using punctuation interventions in this way. But time is short, so let me give you just one. In a rare before and after glimpse of Tremulus's activities, he's marked Alfrich's translation of the Nicene Creed, written on folios 247 recto and verso of Hatton 114, with his full arsenal of interventions. Um, he's clar clarified word divisions, modified vowels, both medially and with a superscript I above the verbal prefix GE. He's glossed a number of mostly small, easy words, and introduced a fairly high number of punctuation interventions. And what I've highlighted here are just the punctuation uh, interventions. He then produced a full, clean copy in his own hand. A glance at the Middle English version found on folio 6 of manuscript Junius 121 reveals a stark contrast in punctuation. In the Old English, he inserted several puncti and converted and inserted many more puncti elevati, whereas he employs just one in his final transcription. That's the one highlighted there. So here we're witnessing, and, and this is a, a transcription of, of both of those texts side by side, and on the left in, in yellow is highlighted uh, the full uh, range of inter his interventions. Uh, we're, we're, use, we're, we're seeing him using his punctuation interventions, especially the punctus elevatus, as a tool to work out the Old English. Now, ultimately, my, my aim with this project is to form a clearer picture of the materials the tremulous hand was collecting for his vernacular manual for preaching. But I'm here today to talk about the paleography of punctuation and my methodology. As I said, I've been tracking these interventions for some time now. And until recently, the methodology I've employed has consisted of close examination of the individual manuscripts in situ, producing a tally of interventions per line per folio, followed by a calculation of the intervention density per folio. Given the expense of traveling to and staying near the archives where these manuscripts are held, mostly Cambridge and Oxford, this work has always been conducted under great pressure. Thankfully, the manuscripts held in the Parker Library are now available online in high resolution facsimile, making it possible for me to examine and re-examine Tremulus's activities in a substantial number of his target manuscripts. It recently became necessary and possible for me to formulate a more deliberate and uniform approach that could be applied to each manuscript in turn. Now, one of the first steps in this process is to establish uh, the punctuation system employed by the original scribe and to become familiar with the appearance of his or their marks, ink color, ductus, uh, position of marks, especially the punctus and its position relative to the baseline, and the actual application of punctuation um, in the text. These are all my concern initially with any, any one of these manuscripts. Are other marks than the punctus employed? How does the scribe make clear distinctions between clauses, and if so, with which graphs? Next comes the actual determination of which marks on the page are interventions. And there are four basic tests. Ink color, ductus, yes, punctuation does kind of sort of have a ductus. Um, placement relative to baseline and position in the sentence. Well, the ink color, uh, does the mark differ sufficiently in ink color from the surrounding text? More than might be explained by the scribe recharging his pen, as it were, at the end of a stint. Does it resemble the color of other markings made by tremulus in the, in the immediate vicinity? And these are just some, some uh, examples. We can come back to these if you'd like. Uh, ductus, while there is frequently not much to go by here in that the strokes are few and pretty minimal compared to the formation of letters, especially when it comes to the punctus, still it's possible sometimes to distinguish between a punctus made by the original scribe and one about applied by tremulus. And here you have examples on the left. Those are original. And I, I apologize. I should have kept these in, in scale. Um, the, uh, it, it, they're, they're a lot more similar, some of them, um, it, the way that I, I presented them there. Um, uh, anyway, uh, the, sh the shape can often, often give it away. The, the, you know, you'll encounter uh, the, the punctus made by tremulus at certain stages in his, uh, in his glossing that resembles a blob, like these, these two at the bottom here. 
Um, that's not a nice round um, uh, point. Admittedly, this is not a science, and uncertainty is a pretty constant companion in this endeavor. Uh, placement relative to the baseline. Again, in determining whether a punctus is original or intervention, it's sometimes possible to distinguish between original scribal practice. In, uh, in uh, CULKK318, for example, uh, this is usually a media distinctio, whereas Tremulus had a tendency to put his on the line. And I would include in this category what I refer to as his OCD punctus. Uh, that is, when he adds a punctus before, especially the Tyronean nota, um, uh, just out of habit. And you can see that these are all from um, Cotton Auto C1. Uh, the, the upper uh, left there, you've got the original scribe didn't bother to put a point in front of the and uh, abbreviation. And uh, on the right, that, that's an original one, and you can see where it's placed. That's usual for that scribe. The tremulous hand would, would, would um, consistently uh, apply a point in that position, and usually on the baseline. Uh, and there'll be times when that's the only mark he'll, he'll insert on a, on a folio or part of a folio. That's why I call it the sort of habitual OCD um, kind, of, uh, kind of point. Uh, then position in the sentence. I don't, oops, sorry, I don't have examples for that. That's, that's a different example. Um, the position in the sentence, especially in cases where the shape and ink color of the intervention is so close to the original, the giveaway may be where the mark appears in the sentence. Tremulus wasn't really repunctuating the text. Uh, and there are times when he isn't doing so syntactically. He used his interventions to help him sound out the Old English. And one result of this is that punctuation marks appear where they really have no business being. And at any rate, they frequently appear in places where an analysis of the original punctuation shows they would not have been placed by the Anglo-Saxon scribe. This is the 13th century version of the Shatner comma. Are you familiar with the Shatner comma? William Shatner, Captain Kirk? A typical sentence of William Shatner's would go something like this. When we get to the restaurant, we should order some tasty beverages. There's, there's six more commas in that sentence than really belong in there. And, and there's, uh, frequently, I get, them, get the notion that, uh, that um, uh, Tremulus was, was channeling uh, William Shatner. Um, anyway, uh, a brief word on the layers of Tremulus's glossing activities. Christine Franzen identified seven states of the tremulous scribe's hand as reflected in his glossing. As an aside, she just retracted that in, in that article uh, that appeared in, brain, in the, the journal Brain, where, where his tremor is, is diagnosed. She admits that she was being overzealous when uh, she, she said there were seven states. Anyway, for further details, I'd refer, refer you to her book. But suffice it to say that these layers reflect variations in the ink, the size of the letters, and firmness of the strokes that make it possible to distinguish layers, but also make it difficult to do so. Uh, and here we have, no, come on, there we go. Oops, go back. Um, uh, the two most important layers are the ones that Franzen uh, labels the B state, or bold state, and the M, or mature state. She describes the B state glosses and markings as being upright with thin, thick pen strokes. Some have thin strokes and look more uh, angular. Others show characteristic leftward lean, but they're always small, neat, and compact. The M state is the most characteristic large, usually with a pronounced leftward lean, and often noticeable tremble and disjointed look. The punctuation interventions that accompany the states identified by Franzen do share some of these features, especially ink color, though admittedly most of the marks in question are not big enough to show any degree of tremulousness. I think it might be possible to distinguish, at least to some degree, between his punctuation interventions in these two states. There are several variables, however, and I haven't yet done a systematic in investigation of this as uh, aspect of his um, activities. Now, as my work on these interventions progressed, I wanted to visualize the data to see if I could more readily discover patterns in the intervention of, of the tremulous hand. Initially, I started to plot every relevant intervention on each folio in any given manuscript, entering the data by hand into a series of comma-separated value files for visual manipulation and analysis. Images of each folio were prepared in dimensions approximating 1,000 by 1,500 pixels to facilitate plotting the XY coordinates of each intervention. The fields used in the main CSV file for each folio contain the information that, that's shown here. It quickly, uh, like within a day, became clear to me that entering the data by hand like this was prohibitively time consuming. And if I wanted a shot at completing this project before I expire, a new <laughs> method had to be found. Enter the tremulator. 
Uh, the Tremular, this is a Java-based web app developed by my son, Ian Johnson, who happens to be a programmer working in Silicon Valley. This app allows me to plot each intervention and record the relevant data for each folio in any given manuscript on my touchscreen equipped tablet. The data is then stored in a database on one of his servers. Uh, the, brief, the chief benefits of this tool are an increase in the speed of data entry to acceptable levels, levels and the way it enables us to visualize the data in order to discover the patterns in Tremulous's activities that I spoke of earlier. And if you, if you write down that, that link there or, or get it from me later on, you can, you can actually play with it. There's a, there's a test site set up so you can, you can use the Tremulator. And you won't screw up my data, I promise. Um, but so, so rather than try to hook up the tremulator and, and deal with all kinds of problems uh, to do with, with Wi-Fi, I, I just took some screen uh, shots to show you what it looks like. This is the view that you, that, that you would see on, on your, your uh, iPad or, or, or other tablet or your computer. And essentially, um, you can see that, that when I touch the screen, a little yellow box appears around uh, the place that I want to highlight, and this drop-down menu uh, appears. Um, this, my main, my main uh, project has to do with uh, punctuation at the moment, so I have to choose uh, whether I think it's tremulous or original. Uh, the, f the, the actual punctu punctuation mark, I can, I can choose from that uh, pop-up menu. Um, is it uh, a converted uh, piece of punctuation? I can indicate that as well. Uh, now, right now, I'm focused only on punctuation, but we're looking forward uh, towards the day when, when we'll actually start collecting uh, data on the glosses, the marginal glosses, annotations, and that kind of thing. So that, that's going to be uh, modified. Um, and then there's this little slider about which I'm going to say a, a little bit more, uh, the certainty level. How sure are you? It's really kind of important to, to, uh, to indicate that when you're dealing with, with essentially bits of fly poop. Um, uh, and so that's a really important one. And then finally, of course, you've got the delete key. Uh, if if you, you know, you've, you've made a mistake or you've, you've dropped your pencil on the, on, the, on the iPad and you want to delete an entry, you can do it that way. So it's really quite easy. Now, here's a, a very brief little movie that shows the Tremulator uh, in action. Uh, it's a screen capture. And you can see how, how quickly it goes. Um, I, I spent uh, a week in the British Library about uh, five weeks ago uh, working with uh, Cotton Auto C1, which is the Old English Dialogues manuscript, 137 folios, and I, I, I did the whole thing in a week. Um, 3,135 uh, inter interventions, only, only by tremulous. I didn't do the original punctuation on that one. Um, but it goes uh, quite quickly, and, and this data is then stored on Ian's uh, database, and there you can see uh, the, certain, the certainty bar in action. So I recently used this tool to plot the interventions of Tremulous in CUL KK318 as well, which is the, uh, one of the Old English um, um, uh, bead uh, Historia um, uh, manuscripts. Uh, my son then ran the data, the data through a JavaScript real-time visualization platform that he built called Tributary. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's way over my head, but um, it, it works. Uh, here's a partial view of the data visualized in tributary showing the intervention count per folio and the actual, the actual um, punctuation marks there on the left. I then used the data to produce a simple bar graph showing the distribution of interventions over the entire manuscript. And as you can see, Tremulous was particularly almost exclusively interested in specific passages in the text. And I'll be happy to say more about this in the Q&A or later at coffee. Uh, let me draw this to a conclusion with just a few words on the Tremulator as a tool and its potential for further development, both for my project and for others. First, this issue of uncertainty. Collecting and analyzing data are both subject to human su subjectivity. We can try to anticipate this subjectivity, but attempts to unilaterally remove it would be naive. The best we can do is recognize it by accounting for it whenever possible. When collecting data, we use the human eye to classify a marking's author as best we can. We're limited by the resolution of our imagery as well as the skill of the beholder. A self-aware user can report his or her own uncertainty, but then the question is one of calibration. How uncertain are you? Are you more certain now than you were before? Are you more certain when you're finished with the manuscript than when you started? Perhaps staring at folio after folio has improved your recognition abilities. Perhaps it's biased you further. Our approach uh, was to provide a relative, um, oops, sorry, 
a relative metric for self-reporting. We use that free form slider that had values between zero and 100. Maybe it'll be desirable to limit the possibility, uh, the possible values to a discrete scale, as I've marked up here, perhaps increments of, of, uh, of 10, so that the brain can more easily co compare its certainty of the current mark with how certain it was about another one. To that end, we might be able to create better tooling for reviewing uncertain data. I can imagine an interface that cuts all the squares out of the manuscripts and lines them up next to one another. Perhaps each one has a bar underneath whose width is relative to the certainty so one can quickly review uncertain marks relative to other uncertain or certain marks. And I imagine hovering over one of these small squares uh, would reveal a larger square uh, cut out for context. Clicking on the square would take you to the manuscript in question and highlight the data point that was clicked on. Um, so when, when representing, and finally, when representing the data in our visualizations, we chose, as you saw, to use opacity as the signal encoding uncertainty. This can be considered an elegant solution when showing the marks relative to one another. And as it happens, it can also be effective when showing the marks in the context of, um, of the manuscript itself. Uh, and this is cotton out of C1, the manuscript that I recently um, worked with. You'll note it has no margins, right? Which is why it's important that uh, the, you know, the, the information that the punctuation can give us. There are no marginal annotations in this particular manuscript. Um, so this is uh, a, a very brief uh, little, little clip. I hope you don't get uh, motion sick. Um, but just notice the opacity as they run, run by you. Um, you see how it starts to pick up? Uncertainty starts to, starts to build. And, it, and, and as it happens, that coincides with the change of a hand in the manuscripts. So the, the similarities between the original and, and tremulous started to increase, as did the uncertainty. Um, finally, then, this, this app is being developed as a kind of open source tool. So looking ahead, we anticipate that others might want to use it for data collection of their own. Um, there, it's fairly easy to imagine switching out elements in the drop-down menu that pops up when making a mark. Other projects may have their own set of categorizations and scales they wish to record for marking, and we anticipate other projects would want more flexibility in determining the size or shape of their mark. I'm assured by my son that this isn't too challenging to accomplish either, and, and so development of the Tremulator continues to pace even as I use it to track the reading habits and repurposing activities of this 13th century monk from Worcester. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you looked? So you're looking at the work of one scribe here. And yeah. You initially started looking at you know the words to the left of the mark of punctuation, then the mark of punctuation, and the word to the right. And I'm guessing you could build a, a pattern. You could build up a kind of signature for a given scribe. How do they punctuate things? How do they tend to punctuate? Have, have you looked at that across multiple scribes? Do you have any sense as to how accurate that might be as a way to identify a particular scribe? That's a really good point. Uh, no, and the, 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 the short answer is no, not yet. But I have thought of that. I mean, you know, in, in looking at the at the the original punctuation practices of these old English manuscripts, uh, there there there's quite a range of variety. Um, uh, Cotton out of C1, very basic, just the punctus essentially, and and the punctus versus for the end of a sentence. Um, and CULKK318 makes use of some uh, puncti um, elevati. And then there, there are a number of other corpus manuscripts that I haven't really dug in uh, to yet, 178 and 198, that um, use the full range. And, and, and so, yeah, I suppose you, you know, if, you, if you tracked those uh, punctuation practices, you might be able to put together a signature. Indeed, that's a good point. But you can now do it with the tremulator. <laughs> Without the tremulator, you're lost. <laughs> if you have an idea whether he adds more punctuation uh, as he goes on, or... Yeah, that's, well, that, that's it. Uh, what well, I, that's what you normally think, but you might be adding less because he's getting better at understanding old English. <laughs> that's, that, yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, the, uh, the, the, let's see, Hat 114 and 113, they contain uh, homilies, Alfred and Wolfson homilies are less densely punctuated than um, Cotton Auto C1. Cotton Auto C1 seems to be one of the manuscripts that he was intensely interested in. He had uh, an exemplar in Latin that he had next to him. We know which one it was. We know which manuscript he was using, actually. And he was using that to do his glossing. 
Um, when I first uh, applied this test to um, uh, the, the old English bead, I thought, oh, this is absolutely clear because in the beginning of the manuscript, he's interested in, in the, 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 the death of the proto-martyr St. Alban, and at the end of the manuscript, he's in, in, interested in uh, the vision of Drixhelm, and there's hardly anything in between. Right? So he, he doesn't care about all of that, so he's being very selective. Um, then I turned to, to this manuscript and quickly realized that he marked the bejesus out of it. He was interested in, in just about everything. Um, he falls short of, of actually repunctuating the entire manuscript. And, and here, it's in, this is where it becomes important to filter out certain kinds of information. If you filter out all of the, 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 the punctus, the puncti rather, um, because some of them are uncertain, some of them are certain. You get rid of all of those, and you focus only on the punctus elevatus. Um, then, then you get a better picture of what he, uh, what I think he was really interested in, and, and you can uh, discern between within that manuscript between things that he was uh, particularly interested in and others not. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it, it could very well be that that if you're looking at a different manuscript that has a more um, expansive. Um, system of punctuation, he found that easier to read. He may have been reading them at a point when, when he, he had gotten used to it, uh, certainly. I mean, that, that is a, that's, a, that's an important point to consider. It's possible to correlate his method of punctuation over time with yeah. the with, symptoms of his trepidation. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, the, the different stages. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, no, exactly, yeah. Thanks for that. Looks like perhaps another question or two. Can I ask what might be a very silly question? What illness did he have? Um, if you read the article that just came out, they narrow it down to three. Uh, and the one that, that, that sticks uh, in my mind is something that they call essential tremor. There you are. That, I mean, you know, I, I, a congenital condition. No, I, I think they eliminated Parkinson's. Parkinson's is, uh, is, is very, very unlikely. Um, I mean, it's a very, very medical scientific article that, that uh, you know, lays it all out for you. Um, and I think there were, there were three possibilities. Parkinson's was certainly something that they considered. What, one thing I didn't realize was there, there was a, a stint of his, of his uh, writing where uh, you can discern that he's, that he's really shaky, really shaky, and then there's a break, a very, very brief break. It's like he put his pen down, and then it's very steady. And they posit that it was alcohol, that whatever condition he had, that uh, you know, uh, hydrating uh, <laughs> helped. And and uh, you know, so um, essential tremor is the is the term that they use. It's a congenital thing. They don't rule out the the, the possibility that he may have been very very old, um, which of course was the original theory, right? That he was it was shaky because he was old, but that's that's not the case. And they. They had, um, they've got uh, an example in this article of a 75-year-old um, man with the same condition who had that condition for 15 years, and they had him do, a, a, you know, a handwriting, uh, you know, the, the, the quick brown fox jumps over the whatever, um, and, and it showed similarities with, with tremulous's hand. So the proportions are fairly regular. It's tremulousness within. Right. Pretty regular metaphors. Yeah, exactly. All right. You wouldn't be with Parkinson. No, they, 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 they pretty much rule that out. So. Is there any evidence of what, because you said there was an e-copy of Alfred's homilies that, was, that he produced. Not the homilies, no. Oh, Just the Nicene Creed. Okay. Just that one text. Is there evidence that these copies, that if he's doing the sort of the legwork of actually choosing and selecting the passages for a vernacular manual, um, would other scribes whose hands were more aesthetically pleasing then be brought in to copy those up for dissemination? Or were his products maybe being sent out to students and preachers? That's what the, excellent questions, uh, possibilities. I don't think we have evidence to, to decide one way or the other. Uh, it's, it's pretty much up in the air. I mean, it, it's, remember the context uh, in which he was working was post Lateran IV. Right, the, 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 the call to preach more in the vernacular had gone out in 1215 and was then, then you know, per, um, spread about by Episcopal uh, decree. And uh, I think that the, the, there's a consensus that, that the extreme um, 
outer limit of his activities would have been 1250. Uh, so there's this, this sense that, that, you know, okay, they got this mandate from, from the Pope, and the bishop, bishop said, okay, yeah, let's do that. Uh, and someone said, well, somebody has to do this. Somebody has to put together materials in the vernacular. Um, there, were, there were several manuscripts um, containing uh, materials for, you know, preaching manuals in Latin in circulation in, in the 13th century. Um, uh, and so either he got the idea, well, well, if I have to do this, then I, I want it to be in the vernacular, or someone else did, and gave him uh, the, the task. And he, you know, um, he had the materials, so he, he started to work. But we don't really have enough evidence, I think, um, to, to say even definitively that that's what he was doing. Part of what I want to do is to see what emerges at the other end, right? If I look at all these manuscripts and I extract all the bits that he's, he was clearly interested in, what does that look like? Does it resemble something like the, these other Latin uh, collections of exempla, especially, right? I mean, there's, there's no uh, way of, of, of saying that these materials were actually used in sermons, although in the case of the dialogues, uh, the dialogues was used in, in Old English sermons, uh, and there's one, there's one anecdote that stands out in the, in the Cotton manuscript that, that also shows up in Robert um, Manning of Brun in, in a, um, a homily against uh, envy. Um, and so the, the materials show up in, in other contexts. But we don't have that, that kind of evidence. The smoking gun, as it were. I think we probably have to uh, drop the clothes there, but um, thank you very much. Thank you.